كلام قولا طيب كم عندنا بارتيسيبنت بس عشان All right, so um, I'm Naive Bindajam, I'm a spine orthopedic surgeon. Uh, I would like to uh, thank you all for being here today uh, during this time. Today is one of the uh, case series we're going to be probably talking about in the next few months about uh, some conditions relevant to the spine surgery, either before or after as a complication. I would like to um, introduce uh, the speakers, uh, starting with Dr. Ayman Tayyib, he is a spine surgeon with us in King Abdullah Medical City Spine Unit uh, Division uh, Head, and uh, we'll uh, tackle the other speakers' introduction after that. So, Dr. Uh, Ayman, the floor is yours. Okay, uh, let's start. Um, Rahim. thank you for this invitation. Uh, just I would like to, to share my, my screen. Um, this is good. Everybody seeing this uh, screen? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, food um, drop, I think it is one of the challenging uh, uh, problem or complication that we are facing uh, in our feet. And basically, this is difficulty in lifting in the front, the front part of the foot. Uh, and one of, one of us definitely faced this uh, issue uh, in his um, maybe residency or in fellowship or even in his career. The idea that we, why we are picking this uh, foot drop complication, uh, it is very important because uh, we, we would like to know the update, how to, how to deal with it. And definitely now the key of, uh, of treating this problem is to avoid uh, as, as we can during surgery uh, or during um, uh, taking care of our patient. And, and we would like um, to see if there is something in the, in the horizon for this uh, food drop uh, problem. Uh, let's, so, uh, let's start with this um, case one. Uh, it is a 35 years old male, a patient complaining of right leg radicular pain since long time. Uh, lately, the pains become very unknown. So uh, at the time of evaluation, this radicular pain is L5 distribution, uh, physical examination, uh, food nurse reflection is uh, two out of five, which is, as, as I mentioned, uh, since uh, three weeks. So it is mean that this uh, delayed presentation here, uh, for this case, the important thing that we have to discuss with the patient about the outcome of your surgery and explain uh, what is your expected for, uh, for the surgery. And then you have to explain the line of the management uh, for, for, uh, for this problem. So the computation is, is important uh, as this scenario for, uh, for this case. Um, so let's move on for the second uh, case. Um, it is 46 years old. Uh, patient have uh, back pain, mild, radicular pain, uh, left side, uh, progressive L5 distribution. The patient is unable to walk. Uh, physical examination, sensor, sensation is okay, motor is okay, and sphincter is intact. So this is an X-ray, so nothing special, just degeneration uh, in the lumbar area. So we have we ordered an MRI. We found that uh, this patient have L5, uh, L4, L5 uh, disc uh, protrusion or herniation. It's uh, making uh, central stenosis. And um, uh, we put the line of the management for this patient medication, infiltration, epidural infection, uh, injection, but uh, unfortunately the patient is not improving. So uh, definitely the spine surgeon uh, offer him an MIS decompression to, uh, to decompress this area. But after a period of three years, the patient again with a rate come to your clinic complaining of back pain and, uh, and uh, radicular pain also. So uh, the option uh, the surgeon offer him is uh, fixation. This is the MRI after three years of the initial or the index surgery, uh, L4, L5, and L5 is one uh, degeneration. So um, unfortunately, uh, during, uh, after this uh, or during the surgery, uh, 
which is offered uh, for him spinal fixation, post-op, the patient have left-sided uh, foot drop, uh, the action uh, was taken that we have to revise the patient, uh, remove the screw, and uh, then put him in a line of treatment. But uh, definitely after, after, after a period of time, the patient is not improving. Uh, so this is, this is the second scenario what I mentioned. Uh, the third uh, scenario, what I would like to uh, say is, um, 68 years old uh, female, she had uh, left foot uh, weakness since three months, which has become progressive, no radicular pain, no back pain. MRI show this um, uh, lumbar protrusion, L4, L5, at this level. And uh, uh, the sagittal is nothing um, uh, clear that there is a severe stenosis, but uh, it's you know uh, if you if you see that there is some disconcordance uh, uh, between the symptoms and the MRI that is not that clear that there is a severe uh, uh, stenosis that compressing the, uh, the nerve. So uh, if we if we uh, go back uh, if we go back a little bit and in the history on the physical examination uh, you see that this patient is she had. Uh, uh, Stepage gait, left foot drop, uh, left uh, lower limb uh, hyperflexia, uh, left positive uh, Babinski sign, uh, no atrophy uh, in the muscle, leg pain, no fas uh, fasciculation. Uh, sensory, uh, there is no sensory or motor deficit. Uh, straight leg uh, rising test was negative. Uh, if you go a little bit also back and see the history, the patient is. Uh, having a progressive and severe headache. So it means that you have, you have tackle and, and see what is the problem, um, maybe in the central, central, central uh, causes. So we did an MRI and we find that uh, there is some um, cranial lesion, uh, which is uh, maybe the cause. So what is my goal for those cases so, uh, for drop foot? Uh, that we have some some cases that become you have you cannot avoid it some uh, some issues uh, some problem that if you have uh, do a surgery you have to take your time uh, do your decompression uh, if you have uh, other other um, utilization system like navigation or neuro monitoring don't hesitate use it take your time uh, put your uh, instrumentation. And, uh, and the other thing that if you have uh, a disc disconcording um, symptoms, you have to go and, uh, and go deep in the history, be a comprehensive and uh, do a full examination uh, neurologically to see uh, if there is another um, uh, problem that causing this uh, foot uh, drop. By this uh, third case, I would like to uh, finish, Dr. Naif. Uh, you hear me? Hello? Hello? Aywa, Ayman? Yes, yes, yes. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Very, very impressive, uh, especially the last case. Now I'll go to uh, Mrs. Uh, Shahab. She's uh, a physical therapist. Um, has done her uh, bachelor degree and now is doing her master degree in uh, Pittsburgh University in neuro rehab. Uh, welcome, Dr. Shahad. The floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Naif. It's my pleasure to join. And I would like to thank the Saudi Spine Society for conducting these um, informative webinars. And thank you, everyone, for taking the time and being here. So I will go ahead and share my screen. So my talk today will be about assessment and non-operative management of uh, foot drop. Um, 
so first of all, the symptoms of each case uh, of foot drop vary depending on the severity and uh, the underlying condition. Um, and, and typical signs and symptoms uh, would be the following. Uh, inability to raise the front part of the foot. Uh, and that is due to muscle uh, weakness or paralysis in the lateral and frontal um, uh, compartment uh, of the uh, legs uh, uh, that, that are innervated by uh, the superficial and deep uh, perineal nerve, uh, which will result in difficulty during walking due to the inability uh, of uh, doing a heel strike during stance phase and inability to uh, lift the foot off the ground uh, during uh, swing phase. And uh, all of that which uh, result in significant uh, gait uh, deviation. So commonly either a stippage uh, gait uh, that is uh, walking with excessive high knee uh, and hip flexion uh, to clear the foot from the ground or uh, typical uh, circumduction uh, gait. Um, also, patient uh, due to the above mentioned will have a frequent tripping and stumbling uh, because any changes to the center of the gravity in the body will uh, affect the balance, uh, especially when walking on uneven surfaces or climbing the stairs. Uh, also, patients complain of loss of sensation, and it will occur in the uh, front uh, or lateral uh, uh, side of the leg and the dorsum uh, of the foot. And uh, patient may have numbness or tingling sensation or loss of uh, proprioception. Um, now, uh, a thorough assessment uh, must be um, undertaken and uh, started starting with uh, subjective assessment. So uh, the history of the present uh, uh, condition is very important to gather information about the onset and the duration of the uh, condition. And we should also ask specific questions uh, to check if there are pain in other body parts because usually uh, any um, uh, injury in the foot or ankle uh, uh, might biomechanically uh, affect other body parts such as the back and knee. Um, uh, it is also uh, important to address the type of shoes uh, because with foot drop uh, cases, patients uh, will need specific con consideration. And I will uh, elaborate uh, this part when we reach to the management. Um, and also, um, uh, um, it's very important to have a detailed picture uh, of how the condition is affecting the patient's lives uh, in terms of daily living activities and mobilities. Uh, because foot drop markedly um, restrict uh, patient uh, activities, not only walking, but uh, uh, markedly uh, affecting um, patients during driving. Uh, because, for example, if the patient have um, if the patient has um, um, uh, right foot, uh, uh, either uh, drop complete drop or residual weakness, uh, he will uh, not be able to move the foot smoothly between accelerator and the uh, brake pedal. Uh, so um, uh, it will cause um, uh, further challenge. Uh, or also sometimes patients uh, have some challenges uh, um, because their leg uh, or, or foot will uh, go uh, numb. Uh, so it's very important to take uh, these details into considerations to uh, ensure the patient safety. Uh, going now for the uh, objective assessment, uh, um, uh, we should always start with uh, neurologic examination uh, for the foot, uh, including uh, active and passive range of motion to uh, ensure that the ankle joint is not a step. And uh, we should also do manual muscle tests uh, to reveal uh, any weakness or paralysis of the uh, uh, foot uh, muscles. Um, and also muscle flexibility is very important uh, because most of the time and most of the patient will have uh, muscle tightness over the, Achilles, um, over the Achilles and over the uh, calf muscle. Uh, 
uh, and that is due to uh, uh, the lack of dorsiflexion and because the foot will be positioned in uh, plant, reflex, plant reflection uh, most of the time. And uh, it is also important uh, to check the uh, Achilles tendon reflex, to check the S1 and S2 uh, nerve roots. Uh, the ankle joint response might uh, be either uh, diminished or absent uh, um, in some patients. Um, and also sensation is very important. Uh, uh, as we mentioned earlier, um, that uh, hypostasia uh, or numbness may occur uh, on the uh, L4, L5, S1, uh, S2 dermatome. Then uh, we should proceed to functional um, examination. Um, um, heel, heel walking actually is a very um, a great a gross functional activity. Um, and it will uh, uh, test the perineal nerve that supply the uh, dorsiflexors of the foot. Uh, gait pattern uh, um, analysis, um, also we should uh, observe um, any abnormalities during walking. Uh, and uh, foot posture, it's very important to check the arches of the foot because uh, uh, patients who have uh, flat feet, for example, they will walk with perinated uh, um, foot and patients who have a uh, high arch will put excessive pressure on the uh, front part of the foot and the heel of the foot and uh, that might cause further uh, uh, conditions to the foot uh, and patients will be susceptible to heel pain and uh, plantar fasciitis. So we should take um, uh, uh, these um, details into consideration to prevent any further complications. Now, throughout the uh, rehabilitation um, uh, course, we should keep in mind uh, that uh, speciality referral should be considered uh, for any clinical uh, um, findings uh, that indicate some neurological deficits uh, such as problems with bowel and bladder function uh, or incontinence or severe uh, foot deformity. Now the uh, treatment of uh, foot drop depends on the cause. If the cause is successfully treated, uh, uh, for, for example, with uh, L4, L5 disc herniation, foot drop might be uh, uh, improved or even disappear. However, if the cause cannot be treated, uh, the foot drop can be a permanent condition. Uh, either way, a recovery from a foot drop uh, takes several months and patients will deal with this condition in a daily basis uh, uh, and that will affect their uh, mobility and uh, to a great extent. Uh, so uh, physical therapy is a primary management that should be started as soon as possible. Uh, through the rehabilitation phase, we aim to strengthen uh, the uh, foot and leg muscles to improve uh, uh, foot um, and leg muscles uh, flexibility and to maintain ankle uh, range of motion and to improve gait pattern, all of which will help to achieve the long-term goal uh, that is to restore uh, physical function and uh, mobility. So uh, physiotherapy interventions uh, are focused on graded exercises and uh, rehabilitation. Uh, so uh, we should start with therapeutic uh, exercises. We usually start with passive uh, range of motion uh, for patients who have uh, paralysis, progressing to um, active, assisted, uh, active assisted exercises uh, using some tools. Um, and then uh, uh, finally to fully um, active uh, exercises. Stretching exercises are very vital for calf muscle and Achilles tendon uh, uh, because uh, uh, they prevent uh, contractures uh, and uh, um, market uh, tightness. Um, the, the strengthening uh, program should begin uh, with none uh, weight-bearing uh, ankle exercises in all motions. Uh, 
such as isometric exercises or uh, resisted exercises using TheraBand. Uh, and then, uh, so we can focus on isolated muscles and then progress to full weight bearing exercises such as heel walk and, and, and toe walk. And at this particular stage, uh, medical taping is uh, very important to stabilize ankle and to pull into dorsiflexion uh, during, um, uh, uh, while the patient is doing uh, the exercises. Um, then we should um, address balance training uh, to improve stability and to reduce risk of injuries, especially uh, uh, ankle twisting injuries. Uh, and we should start with um, uh, static exercises while standing in a place without uh, uh, moving the feet. And then adding some challenges uh, such as changing uh, uh, surface or um, uh, um, uh, narrow place of support or adding uh, challenges such as um, eliminating uh, the vision and then proceeding to dynamic um, uh, uh, balance of training uh, uh, that is um, uh, that is involving uh, maintaining the postural control while uh, moving in different uh, directions with different uh, uh, amount of resistance. So, um, functional uh, electrical stimulation or neuromuscular electrical stimulation can help generate and increase the contractility of the weak muscles to some extent, uh, especially in the um, uh, tibialis anterior muscle. So, uh, one electrode should be placed over the uh, nerve supply and the other electrode uh, uh, should be over the tibialis anterior uh, muscle. Uh, and the intensity should be raised until visible uh, muscle contraction uh, seen in the um, anterior tibialis. Uh, now, uh, this is the main important and vital um, uh, procedure during the rehabilitation uh, phase, uh, which is the orthotic device prescription. Um, AFUs provide a uh, patient with better and safe mobility. Uh, there are so many AFU options and varieties in the market. Uh, so we should consider many different factors in order to prescribe uh, the most uh, appropriate uh, uh, orthotic uh, for the patient. When it comes to foot drop, uh, we have three main selections. Uh, solid AFU. So the solid AFU, it uh, completely plucks the ankle movements by stabilizing the foot in a planty grade position in 90, degree, uh, 90 degrees. Uh, and this um, uh, is enough degree to clear the foot from uh, the ground. Uh, this type of AFU provides maximum stability to the lateral and medial aspect uh, of the uh, ankle. Um, and uh, most importantly, it prevents contractures uh, to the calf muscle and, and Achilles tendon. Uh, so this type of uh, AFU is a great choice during the beginning uh, of the rehab course uh, when the patient has either no active movement in the foot or an unstable ankle or uh, um, if the patient has uh, marked tightness. Uh, the second type is hinged AFU. Uh, hinged AFU uh, has uh, a mechanical ankle uh, joint as it's uh, shown. Um, and this joint um, allow free ankle uh, movement and full dorsi flexion during walking. So it provides a more normal gait. And uh, this uh, AFU um, aids in walking in uh, uh, uneven surfaces and aids in climbing stairs. Um, and it is a great option uh, during um, uh, uh, the mid of rehab uh, course when the patient uh, um, uh, ha has um, uh, active uh, range of motion and um, uh, some movements in the ankle. 
uh, and put. Uh, the third would be the soft uh, praise, and it is a light um, solution. Most of the patients like it and enjoy it because it's very comfortable and cosmetic somehow. Uh, so, uh, and it is effective in the later stage of rehabilitation when the patient gains uh, foot uh, muscle strength, significant foot muscle strength, and needs only minimal uh, uh, assistance in lifting either the foot uh, or toes. And it is adjustable, so we can control uh, the amount of support given, and patient can even wear it during sleep uh, for um, uh, stretching uh, effects. Uh, now, after fitting the right apple for the patient, gait training should uh, uh, start to emphasize on optimizing uh, walking performance by preventing uh, substitution and adaptive changes in lower limbs, such as uh, excessive hip flexion or knee flexion, as well as to uh, increase uh, uh, walking endurance. Um, last but not least, we should spend some time in educating the patient uh, uh, to, about proper footwear uh, to help keep the uh, feet uh, um, uh, stable and firm. So uh, the shoes should have um, uh, the shoes should have uh, support and should be cushioned. Um, and uh, shoes uh, must have either shoelace or a, uh, have um, a strap a Velcro closure. And uh, um, it should have uh, um, um, uh, the um, movable uh, insole uh, so we can replace it with the uh, apple. Uh, also, we need to advise the patient to inspect the skin of the foot uh, because um, uh, uh, each time the patient remove uh, the orthosis, uh, it might cause um, uh, pressure uh, over the bony prominence. And then uh, certain modifications uh, will be needed to improve uh, the fit. Uh, we should also educate the patient to avoid a prolonged leg crossing because that might cause um, a pressure over the common perineal nerve. And um, uh, finally, emphasizing high repetition of exercises as a repetition helps activate uh, neuroplasticity. So uh, now we have the pro things to a closure. Thank you uh, all for listening. Thank you very much, Shahad. Very impressive talk. Uh, now I'll move to Dr. Piraz Wali. He's a consultant orthopedic surgeon. He completed his training in McGill University and followed uh, by two fellowships, one in adult foot and ankle reconstruction, and the other one is in adult hip and he's a recon at the University of British Columbia, Vancouver. He has participated in many national and international conferences and scientific publication, uh, and he is currently uh, practicing in Jeddah. Dr. Frost, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Naif, and thank you to, to the uh, Saudi Spine Society for the invitation of all the speakers. Um, I'll try to, to make my talk uh, more practical. Uh, so let me see if I can start the talk. So uh, as I said, it's just a quick overview. I'll, uh, we may re-emphasize some of the points that mentioned by my, the, uh, my colleagues. So as mentioned, um, tibialis anterior or uh, ankle extensor are more, uh, are more uh, controlled or innervated by L4 to S1. And we mostly see them with, uh, in the spine related injuries in L4, L5 injuries and uh, ankle extension mainly controlled by tibialis anterior, extensor, extensor digitorum longus, and extensor hallus longus. And it uh, actually part of, it affects our gait in a sense that uh, it helps us to clear our foot during uh, swing phase and optimize the um, heel strike to avoid uh, slapping the foot. So etiology is normally just to have a broad approach. It could be central nervous system, so, Similar to the case that Dr. Eman showed, could be spine related, could be peripheral nerve injury or neuropathy, which is the most common uh, we see in our practice, or could be atherogenic, whether it's a hip and knee replacement uh, cases or whether it's a spine complication. Clinical assessment has been covered. They just uh, really emphasize on taking a thorough history. Uh, you want to make sure that you know the etiology of the foot drop, 
you want to assist the patient uh, mobility, is the patient better than wheelchair um, bound or is the patient able to walk? What's the, the patient's limitation? And what's the prognosis of recovery for his uh, foot drop? Clinical assessment, again, we're assessing the gait, the range of motion of the ankle joint. Uh, we're assessing muscle, muscle testing. It's not enough to, to say that this patient has a foot drop. We need to know the grade, the manual muscle, muscle testing. We need to know what other functions are still retained, what other muscles, uh, the other tendons, such, such as tibialis posterior, the perineal tendons, the uh, uh, flexors, and so on. Sensory assessment reflexes, and very important to assess the uh, presence of a deformity, whether it's equinus deformity or other deformities. And so the goal here is to obtain an accurate baseline exam. Imaging, uh, in case of foot drop, and in addition to the standard imaging, which is done for the main intelligence, such as the spine, maybe a patient needs an MRI or so on. For the focusing on the foot itself, we need uh, weight-bearing x-rays for the foot and ankle, and it's mainly to assist the foot alignment and looking for uh, any signs of degeneration or rigid uh, deformities. Uh, neuro neuro neurological studies are uh, important, such as uh, EMG nerve conduction study, and again, it's to obtain a baseline and for fo follow up to assist recovery. Coming into prognosis, so prognosis of foot drop related to lumbar uh, disorder is not well clear in the literature. It's mostly uh, limited to small case series and case reports, and there's a big heterogeneity in the in the data. So it's uh, different definitions, different follow up times different recovery and definitions of foot drop recovery as well. However, um, most of the literature uh, or what's published has shows that full recovery can be observed between 27 to 61% after undergoing uh, decompression surgery. And uh, foot drop due to disc herniation generally had a better recovery than uh, caused by lumbar spinal stenosis. And general prognostic factors through the literature are age, so the younger the patient, the higher chance for recovery, duration of a foot drop, the preoperative muscle power, the num number of involved uh, spinal level, and associated lumbar disease. So just jumping into management. So as Ms. Shahad, uh, or before that, so let's say you had a similar, a similar situation to what's been presented. Either a patient had a a uh, disc herniation, or it's a post-surgery, uh, iatrogenic uh, foot drop, or it's a motor vehicle accident, somebody came in with a fracture dislocation, or a coda equina and uh, resulted in foot drop. So it's a bad situation. We all feel bad. It's a horrible, um, it's a horrible day for everyone, but uh, the goal here is not to be distracted. So you want to rec recognize what happened. You want to investigate it. You want to treat whether it's a, st a disc herniation or a uh, coda equina syndrome or a malpositioned hardware, you need to investigate and treat that. However, which is mostly a lot missed is you need to brace it, okay? And keep it moving. So make sure that this is not missed is to apply some kind of an ankle uh, foot orthrosis to, he to keep the foot in, um, in neutral, to keep the ankle joint in neutral position. And, uh, and either you can do a custom brace or you can do one on your own using a plaster of Paris at the hospital just to keep the ankle and avoid equinus contracture and keep it moving. So consult your physiotherapist at the hospital. Let them start moving the ankle, prevent contractures, pre preventing deformities. And the goal here is to keep the foot, the foot and ankle supple until either the uh, full recovery or further surgical treatment. And so you want to avoid these patients. So what happens sometimes is it's missed. The, everyone is distracted by the spine injury. The patient gets referred from one center to another center. Two, two years later, he gets referred to the foot and ankle surgeon with a bad equinus deformity. So the goal of, the, uh, of treatment and uh, foot drop in general is to provide a stable, pain-free, plantigrade foot. The ability to dorsiflex both voluntarily and in phase. Ability to clear uh, the ground in swing phase prevention of stiffness and progressive deformity. So treatment considerations, whenever uh, I see one of those patients, there's a list that goes through my mind. So it's what's the cause of this injury? What's the injury level? What's the, what are the muscle deficits? And what's, what are the remaining function? What other tendons do we have that uh, are still intact? 
tendon function still uh, intact? Is there a deformity, whether it's an equinus deformity, whether it's, there's a varus or valvus deformity of the foot and ankle? If there, is the deformity flexible or is it rigid? Is, there, uh, is the foot sensate or not? And what's the patient mobility? What's uh, his current limitation? And what's the patient expectations? So Ms. Shad has covered this already. So, but just to reemphasize, so non-operative treatment for these patient, patients are usually it's multidisciplinary. Or there are surgeons, whether it's a spine surgeon, uh, the neurosurgeon, uh, or peripheral nerve surgeon, or the orthopedic foot and ankle surgeon. There's a, a neurologist usually involved, a physiotherapist, occupational therapy, rehab medicine, an orthotist. And so the physiotherapy role is, uh, has a great role in the beginning uh, to provide uh, a range of motion exercise to keep the joint supple and preventing deformity. Brace uh, that we mentioned, and it's mostly plantar and uh, ankle AFO brace, which, which uh, provide a plantar flexion stop hinge and assist in dorsiflexion. And if it's a flaccid paralysis or a complete parotid foot, so probably a, fix, uh, a fixed uh, AFO brace would be optimal. In regard to operative options, so the, usually the patient comes to, come to see us after a year or two and to discuss the, those options. So the available options for these patients are decompression, and this is usually done by the spine surgeon, um, uh, nerve, uh, nor, nerve surgery for peripheral nerve injuries. Uh, and then we're talking about the foot and ankle. Specifically, we have options of tendon transfers, soft tissue releases, and lastly, joint arthrodesis. So I got a lot of questions regarding time of surgery. So when do you uh, uh, plan to do the surgery? For, so usually we wait for any motor improvement and post, post lumbar decompression, most of the recovery happens over the si first six weeks. However, there's still progressive motor recovery that can, can be observed up to one or two years of the decompression surgery. So moving toward uh, the tendon transfers. So, um, there are principles for tendon transfers. And so the first principle is to correct any contracture. So it's, the transfer tendon cannot co correct any uh, stiffness in the joint or, um, or uh, deformities. So these are needs to be corrected. There's a, the transfer tendon should have adequate power in the transfer. So usually the transfer muscle or tendon should have a plus four uh, or more to be able, as, the, as it loses one, one um, power grade after the transfer. There should be a sufficient uh, amplitude in the transfer. The, it should be a straight line of pull. So you want to avoid um, trans trans transferring a tendon around a, a certain bone or joint. It needs to have a, a straight line of pull for optimal mechanics. It, it should be a functional integrity. It must be preserved with the tendon itself and avoid injuring it during the transfer. The soft tissue bed where we plan to transfer the tendon should be favorable without any open wounds, infections, or scarring. And so it's one tendon for one function. We want to avoid uh, uh, transferring one tendon for multiple functions. So in general, the tendon transfer choices, we have the tibialis posterior tendon, which is the most commonly used. The other uh, tendons could be perineus uh, longus, flexor digitorum longus. The route uh, could be, uh, and we'll, I'll show it in a few slides, but there could be either circumferential or interosseous to reach the anterior aspect of the uh, foot. Aside to insertion, usually we inserted the dorsum of the foot and this uh, could be attached to tendon, preosseum. However, mostly we attach it to bone and we found good results attaching tendon to bone. Fixation technique could be sutures, tables, uh, bone anchors or, or screws. And so you, typically it's a four incision technique. And this I'm just showing an example of it tibialis posterior tendon uh, transfer. So we mark our incisions. So the tibialis posterior is harvested distally at the medial aspect of the foot. It brought up um, at the level of the uh, medial aspect of the uh, leg. And it's, pa it's passed through the interosseous membrane to the anterolateral aspect of the uh, leg, brought down to the uh, dorsolateral aspect of the foot. And it, we drill a hole at the uh, middle of lateral cuneiform, insert the tendon, uh, tension it and, fit and hold it with the um, interference screw. Proper physiotherapy is crucial after. And uh, let, uh, we have found that early active mobilization has no added risk so, to, for any failure. So compared 
to uh, immobilization. And this is based on randomized controlled uh, study. So important aspect is to balance the force. So we know that there are te for, uh, muscular forces in the medial lateral aspect of the foot and the membrane. Taking one of those tendons transfer uh, tr and transferring it to the dorsal of the foot may cause imbalance. So very important to, to assess what are the muscular functions that are still retained. And um, uh, so we can um, select the, the uh, tendon with, that is needed for transfer without causing imbalance and further deformity. So po typical post-operative rehab, the first two weeks are uh, after tendon transfer, usually the patient in a, in a short leg splint and uh, none with bearing. This is progressed to uh, a boot with a uh, uh, with a starting active and gentle passive range of motion and gradual weight bearing program, progressing that further to further strengthening and full range of motion, proprioception training. Night splints are used for at least three months to prevent recurrence of any equines deformity. Outcomes so far, there's a few studies and literature that shows restoration is about 33, up to 33% of the normal ankle function. The most patients are able to function daily activity, activities and gait ability without with satisfactory improvement. Ability to dorsiflex uh, the foot during the swing phase, improve, uh, improve patient reported outcome measures. And most patients were able to discontinue using of braces for daily activities. So th these, uh, in most cases, are life changing to the patients. Moving to other surgical options. So we have uh, soft tissue releases, and these are usually done in patients where they there are equinus uh, contracture, and it's usually to correct Achilles tendon or gastrocnemius um, complex contracture before proceeding to the tendon transfer. And it's most of, more than 90% of the time, it's done uh, in the same setting, the same surgery with, with tendon transfers. Uh, so it's a very, uh, very crucial to assist the soft tissue contracture. If, if we're able to correct it with stretching with the physiotherapy protocol, then we'll do that. Otherwise, a release uh, tendon or uh, muscle release will be done at the time of surgery. It's either an Achilles tendon lengthening or gastrocnemius uh, uh, recession. And it's mainly to correct uh, the equinus contracture to a neutral position of foot. Lastly, the last procedure I'll be talking about is joint arthrodesis. And these usually for fixed deformities, which tendon transfers are not able to correct. Um, and also could be a salvage surgery for a failed tendon transfer or someone where you have a, you're in a very bad situation with someone with a complete paralytic, paralytic foot with no retained uh, muscle function. And these can be mostly done as ankle arthrodesis, uh, tibiotalar calcaneal arthrodesis, pantalar arthrodesis, or tibial arthrodesis. And uh, there are many advancements in this field where now we're doing them um, arthroscopic, so it's minimal invasive. Two small uh, poke incisions to insert the camera and the arthroscopic instrument, and after that, percutaneous fixations with screws or a nail to hold the position of a plantigrade foot. So just a take home message. So you wanna, you wanna, in general, for any foot drop, you wanna approach it by identifying the cause. Assist for deformities, assist for any, assist what's, uh, what other muscular functions are missing and what's still retained. Early bracing and range of motion is priority. And if you, if you want to take one uh, home message from this talk is early bracing and early range of motion. Tendon transfers are available when there's no further recovery. And tendon transfers are for flexible deformities. Arthrodesis are for fixed deformities. Uh, we have a low threshold for Achilles uh, soft tissue lengthening. Thank you. Well, well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Firas. Uh, that was very narrow, uh, summarizing uh, the whole thing about the foot and ankle surgery. Although it's not my favorite fellowship, I would say, or specialty, but I was hammered during my residency to see a lot of these things because my program director was a foot and ankle surgeon. Uh, I'll open the floor for questions. Um, so a few things I need to mention. Uh, please, Dr. Cross, correct me if I'm mistaken. Total ankle arthroplasty is contraindicated in this case, right? Yes. So there is no role for ankle replacement 
uh, okay. in these cases at all. The other thing is, do you guys have any foot and ankle like foot drop protocol or something like that? So in a sense, the protocol consists of immediate management. So bracing, early, early physio, referral, uh, assessing the cause and treating whether it's a spine related, whether it's a peripheral nerve injury. However, uh, these are the, the initial protocol. Uh, the referral to the foot and ankle surgeon usually is not urgent. It can be done, let's say, after six months, one year, one year and a half. And this is mainly for patients either with deformities or, are not, or have failed to recover from foot drop. So, in other words, we should not call you early enough? <laughs> yes. Um, one of the uh, attendees was asking about the tip and structure. I think the pathology is different. You cannot use tip. Uh, posterior, posterior uh, tibias posterior tendon transfer if the tip end is ruptured unless it's not reconstructable but the pathology is different that's what I'm stressing about yes um, so we need to pay attention to that um, do you use like EMG or nerve conduction study or any other surgeon has used that does it dictate anything in your plan yes yeah, so uh, I'm blessed to have a neurologist who's uh, next door to me and who works with me so these patients usually gets referred, and uh, I advise to refer them early to a neurologist uh, for a uh, EMG, whether it's a spine-related or peripheral nerve. It's good to document a good baseline test and for future follow-up, and it helps us also to assess the other uh, nearby muscles also, uh, to assess the function of the nearby muscles. How, how, how soon? Like, so... So typically, um, uh, in, in let's say, because um, most more than ninety percent of the patients we see are with peripheral nerve uh, injuries. Usually, they're uh, they're referred by six weeks after injury. So if six weeks is for a baseline, and they're followed after that another six weeks, and every three months or six months for further follow up, just to follow up the recovery. All right. Um, for Ms. Shahad. Um, Excuse me. Is there any role for nerve stimulation techniques? Do you think they help? Well, actually, nerve stimulation is um, a complementary to the rehabilitation. Uh, it doesn't work by its own. Uh, so we always advise to uh, use uh, the uh, functional electrical stimulation, like doing, um, uh, putting the electrodes and asking the patients to do exercises. Dr. Firas, they asked about how soon do you get the patient to bear weight after arthrodesis? So typically, typically the patient starts a gradual weight bearing program by eight weeks after surgery. So, and we follow that based on the uh, uh, fu assessing the fusion at the fusion site. But most patients, six to eight weeks, they start a gradual weight bearing program. Yeah. Um, the I think our literature in the spine is a bit different and more optimistic than foot and ankle, but it's very impressive how variable the uh, uh, observations yeah. and these things. Um, some of the papers were talking about sixty percent recovery within the first few weeks after the surgery, like after spine decompression. Another paper from UK was talking about depends on the etiology. If the compression on the L5 nerve roots. Uh, it, it has a more prognostic favorable uh, outcome compared to inflammatory reactions like discrimination or autoimmune disease. Uh, but it's still like a uh, randomized control study will, uh, will be split in these things. Definitely. Dr. Ayman, what did you do with your patients? I know these are not yes. your cases, I'm just yeah, kidding. Yeah. You, know, you know, yeah, actually it is uh, um, quite challenging those, um, especially uh, what I mentioned, the case that uh, uh, malpositioning or uh, or cage problem. So it's very, very essential as a spine surgeon, especially for the junior surgeon, that they have to focus about, they have to take your, their time during decompression and uh, put, putting the screws. If they have uh, um, other utilities like an OR or neuromonitoring, they don't hesitate, take your time, do it. Uh, uh, don't rush. It's very, very important that um, uh, any uh, for us it's better to avoid those complications than uh, treating because there is no many options 
for those patients. So it's very, very important uh, as a take home message for, for, for the surgeon. Totally. I, I think, as Dr. Firas also mentioned, um, make sure about the ankle stubble is not stiff. Uh, use the AFOs, stick with your physical therapist and be like with a foot and ankle surgeon. Um, yeah, what, one point also is that what I mentioned that in the, in the last case that it's very, very crucial that you spend your time with your patient. Don't rush for doing MRI or whatever. Uh, to examine the patient very well because some yeah it is it is a rare it is a rare cause but it's very very important that uh, uh, dig more take your time uh, uh, take the history full examination uh, evaluate your patient very well uh, so that you you pick uh, you pick the problem and you can treat it or direct your patient directly to who's uh, who's will to treat this patient. Um, if you guys allow me, I have a question for you guys. Uh, is there a role for a late decompression in this patient? Did you ask that question? <laughs> <laughs> so, as far as I'm concerned, um, the earlier the better. It's one of the indications to get the surgery done as soon as possible. I would say semi-urgent if you have a weakness, only like weakness without any pain or anything. You have to do the surgery. Talking about the late, I would say based on literature from my reading, I would say more than four weeks is not that promising, but there is also... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, is, it is a little bit of debate because uh, I have one patient that he has already delayed uh, foot drop and, uh, and after that he is having no pain. So the question, do I have to do the decompression or leave it? Uh, actually, I, I saw this patient in my fellowship and I didn't touch him, and he is doing well. And, and still, if they, if you have any suggestion, because uh, it's a great zone. Uh, it's a great zone. For definitely a great zone. I think the Turk uh, home message for residents, students, or physical therapists: if you see somebody with back pain, radicular pain, or numbness, that's fine. They can wait, and then we can go through the conservative management. But if they have a weakness along with those or only weakness, you need to see somebody like a spine surgeon. Um, there's a call, uh, question for uh, Ms. Uh, Shahad. Is, is taping really working with foot drop? Taping only works uh, to um, stabilize the medial and lateral aspect of the ankle and also to pull the foot into dorsiflexion and minimize uh, the plant, uh, plant reflection uh, position. So um, it works with the exercises. It works as um, uh, like uh, aiding um, uh, during the movement, but again, not by itself. Um, any other questions? All right, I think we come to a conclusion. Thank you very much for your time. And we'll be picking up more uh, interesting cases and talks next few uh, months. Thank you, Dr. Ayman, for your, uh, the presentation. Dr. Firas, uh, Ms. Shah, I appreciate your time and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone.